Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Evening Devotion. Tonight, we're going to be reading out of Ecclesiastes 1.7. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. In the New King James, it says, All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. Now, I've had atheist friends tell me, oh, all them people in the past there, they were all Neanderthals. Really? How is it this guy knows how evaporation and condensation works? Does the river turn around and flow back uphill to where it came from? No. How does it get there? The water comes from the source. It flows down into the ocean. The ocean has an evaporation process. It collects in the clouds. The clouds move up over the source, and it rains back down in there again. It's a constant circle. How does he know about that if he's a Neanderthal? Well, because he's not a Neanderthal. The people back then were smarter than we were. There's passages in the Bible where it says, well, back in the beginning where this guy, uh, th th these two had a, these kids, and this kid built this city. Who helped him? Because it doesn't say anything about him looking for help, that he just built this city. If that reminded you of a song, it did me too. Oh, excuse me. It says he built a city. And then another guy, this guy built the city. They understood metallurgy back then. They understood government. They understood economy. They were smarter than we are. How many people in your network of friends and family knows how to grow, actually knows how to grow a garden? They grew whole fields. These people were not Neanderthals. They were very, very smart. They just didn't have technology. And I think, personally, and this is just me, most of the technology we have today has been, has been part of the downfall of, of uh, society. There's just some lines you should never cross. You may be able to, you may have the ability to, you just shouldn't do it. There's some technology we just should not have. Because it takes away those natural born skills that people used to have. It used to be a normal thing to know how to do all these things. Uh, you struggle to get people to even remember to put oil in their car. Worse yet, they've got a rash across America of people when their car is low on oil and somebody tells them, oh, you can just use vegetable oil. And they go to the shop because the motor locked up and they pull the oil pan off and it's all jelly. There for a long time, they didn't know what was causing this. And then somebody went to a shop and it's on a channel called just rolled in and i watched this and somebody the guy actually admitted i'll put vegetable oil in there that's not petroleum and that's not what that's made for all that stuff that that we take for granted today that we hire people to do that was all normal stuff everybody did i grew up in a time when that was that way you didn't hire somebody to rebuild your porch. You you did it. You went and got the wood, the nails, and the hammers. Sometimes friends, sometimes people from the church would come help, and you'd tear it down and rebuild it. You worked on your own car. You didn't take it to a mechanic shop. Rarely did it ever go to a shop. You did it yourself in the driveway. I can't tell you how many rocks, rock bruises I've had in my back laying on rocks doing swapping transmissions and repairing stuff underneath. I mean, just coming out completely covered from head to toe in grease. Yeah. It all started when I was 12. Rebuilt my first engine. It's a lot harder to do now. All that stuff, we, we took all that stuff for granted nowadays. But here back then, Solomon... Thousands. I mean, it was Solomon lived, what, 4,000 years ago, 3,500 years ago, something like that? He knew this stuff. This is simple science, and he knew it. Most people today have no clue. Even in college, they have no clue how it works. That's amazing to me, because I learned this in school. Anyway, starting verse 1, all is vanity. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. This is Solomon. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It's funny that he calls himself the preacher. But I find it interesting that the word preacher is capitalized. 
in the Bible, when they capitalize in a notation like that, it's usually because it's referencing Jesus or the Father. Could this be referencing Christ? Maybe. I don't know. Christ is in every book in the Bible. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. Climate change is only real in the fact that the, that the weather changes. <laughs> there is no, we're not having a, ne a negative detriment on the earth. It's not happening. Oh, they got all their little science and everything. It's not true. We are not that powerful. Especially since God's running the show. The sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes toward the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. You know what he just described? Jet stream. How did he know about that? We don't, we don't feel the jet stream down here. It's way up there. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is what will be. Listen closely to what he says here. This book is full of very, very important information. That which has been is what will be. The past will happen again. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. <laughs> yeah, but we've never had these modern conveniences before. Are you sure about that? An archaeologist and a few other people were in a helicopter flying over Egypt and some of the ruins they have over there and the pyramids and everything. Because there was this, there's this theory that the Great Pyramid was actually a resonating chamber. And it, it also doubled as a water pump, a giant water pump. And it said that the way the pump works, and there's a specific name for it, and people can build them on a PVC pipe. Um, the way the pump works would cause a resonating thunk. And the resonating chamber, that great hall, was designed to resonate that. And, and, they, and there's a group of people right now that are trying to get permission. They said, we think this is a power generator and we want permission to fire it up. So these guys are flying over in a helicopter over all these ruins and everything, and they're looking, they're like, does that look familiar to anybody? And they just so happen to have a, a scientist involved with, with you know certain types of electronics and stuff like that because they have different kind of people that do this stuff. He looks down, he says, that's a circuit board. It also just so happens that all those ruins are made out of very high silica content stone. Didn't come from that region, they brought it in. So they landed, they went down to one of those with all the columns. He picked up a piece of metal and he walked up to one of the columns and he started to tap on it. He got to a certain point and he tapped it and the sound reverberated around the entire complex. He said, this is a circuit board. These people were harnessing power. They're still working on that. They're still trying to come up with some more information. There's books and papers being written about it, but yeah. It was all these modern conveniences we have now, they had it back then. Just, it was just very different than what we have today. There's so much we don't know from the past, but it all starts, comes back, back around and starts all over again. Is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new? It has already been in ancient times before us. You think the cell phone I'm recording on right now is new? Of course it's not. They, they could communicate vast distances back then. In fact, quite interestingly, there's a, and you got to dig to find this, but recently they found a chamber in front of one of the pyramids. I think it was the smaller one. It's got the big gash in the front of it. And it was a chamber and they didn't know it was there and they found it by accident. And so when they cleaned out and got down in there, there was a boat in there and it was partially disassembled. The sails were put down and the boat, the, the, the sails were of a really weird material. So you can look all this up. I did and 
that material that they said this is strange it's strangely woven and it's weird it feels weird well in the process of them digging through this stuff uh, the sale the, the sales disappeared well they were like okay well somebody stole them we don't know who they don't know where they went so they got in there and they're examining the boat now, this is a very interesting boat and somebody who who is a, who is an expert in boats like this boat wasn't meant for water like how do you how can you tell well, because it's not sealed in fact, there's gaps in between the planks. And he goes, and funny enough, the because he said, this boat is worn. This has been used. But the damage that was on it was erosion from wind damage, blowing the sand against it. And they're like, okay, so what do you think? He goes, well, I'd like to see those sails because this may be a solar ship. This may be a boat that can actually propel itself above the ground somewhat. We don't know. They're still digging into that and trying to find that out. Very interesting stuff. So there's a whole lot more that's gone on in the past that we don't know about. A lot more. And this side of heaven, we're never going to find it because they're hiding it all. You ever wonder how they drill those perfectly straight holes? Now, they have the tools they use to do it. They know how they did it. It's actually quite simple. One guy uh, replicated it because he saw a picture of one of, of the tools. He replicated it and he drilled a hole right through a piece of granite with a copper pipe kid you not it all involves a tuning fork everything back then was sound sound was a it had a lot of power contained within it pretty amazing so no there is nothing we can say see this is new it has already been in ancient times before us now this is funny that solomon says ancient times because he was back close to the beginning so what ancient times is he referring to <laughs> kind of makes you wonder what was before us and we'll find that out later. There is no remembrance of former things. We forget our past. And then we're doomed to repeat it. That's Where do you think that saying comes from? Right here in Ecclesiastes 1. Nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. The vanity of wisdom. The wisdom brings a lot of negativity when you learn it. So he's being very clear here. None of this is new. And... In a couple of generations, everybody's going to forget everything that happened. They'll forget it, and then they'll repeat it over again. If the Lord didn't put a stop to it, we would constantly repeat until we destroyed ourselves. This is the kind of people that we are. Everything sublunary is on the move. Time knows nothing of rest. The solid earth is a rolling ball. It's not flat. It's a globe. I know there's a lot of flat earthers out there that are struggling with this. It's a globe. The solid earth is a rolling ball and the great sun himself, a star, obediently fulfilling its course around some greater luminary. Tides move the sea. Winds stir the airy ocean. Friction wears the rock. Change and death rule everywhere. The sea is not a miser's storehouse for a wealth of waters. For as by one force, the waters flow into it. By another, they are lifted from it. That would be your evaporation. Men are born but to die. Everything is hurry, worry, and vexation of spirit. Almost sounds like that guy is alive right now, doesn't it? Because that's exactly what society is. They want you to hurry and worry and be vexed about everything. And I am a big fan of pushing that stuff away and saying, I'm not going to fear. I'm not going to worry about it. I don't want to be stressed. In fact, my doctor was quite specific when he told me, you must eliminate as much stress out of your life as you can because it's making your disease worse. You got it. I will do that very thing. And I have been. Friend of the unchanging Jesus, what a joy it is to reflect upon thy changeless heritage, thy sea of bliss, which will be forever full, since God himself shall pour eternal rivers of pleasure into it. He's, he's uh, referencing, it has not entered into the mind of man what God has laid up for him. Remember, the books, if, if all the things Jesus Jesus did were written down, I suppose the whole world couldn't hold the books. Okay, well, one layer of those books is five and a half quadrillion. It kind of puts a little bit more of a stronger view of what God has laid up. Our finite minds cannot fathom it. It is beyond our comprehension, what God has laid up for us. Because it makes you wonder what all Jesus did, that it would fill the world with books. Hmm. It's only been 6,000 years here. 
We seek an abiding city beyond the skies, and we shall not be disappointed. The passage before us may well teach us gratitude. Father Ocean is a great receiver, but he is a generous distributor. What the rivers bring him, he returns to the earth in the form of clouds and rain. That man is out of joint with the universe, who takes all but makes no return. To give to others is but sowing seed for ourselves. We talked about this this morning. He who is so good a steward as to be willing to use his substance for his Lord shall be entrusted with more. And so when the Lord gives you more, you have more responsibility. Friend of Jesus, art thou rendering to him according to the benefit received? Has the Lord blessed us and are we returning that blessing by giving and giving of ourselves, giving of our substance, giving to others? It doesn't have to be money. It can be anything. Much has been given thee. What is thy fruit? Hast thou done all? Canst thou not do more? Or we can definitely do more. To be selfish is to be wicked. I believe, do I remember? I can't try to remember what the verse says. I think the verse, the verse says it's, it's akin to some kind of witchcraft. I forget what it said. Suppose the ocean gave up none of its watery treasure. It would bring ruin upon our race. God forbid that any of us should follow the ungenerous and destructive policy of living unto ourselves. And that's what most of the world does today, unfortunately. Jesus pleased not himself. All fullness dwells in him. But of his fullness have all we received. Jesus didn't die on the cross for him. First, he died on the cross for the Father. His death on the cross redeemed creation. Next, he died on the cross for us so that we might have salvation. He didn't do that for himself. He gave up everything to gain more. And then gave it all away. That's amazing. All fullness dwells in him, but of his fullness have all we received. O oh, for Jesus' spirit, that henceforth we may live not unto ourselves. Lord, may we be willing to give, willing to live for others, willing to bless others, willing to give of ourselves to others. Now, that's we can't do it every single day. There's, sometimes there's just no opportunities for it. But Lord, when the opportunity arises, may we be always be ready and willing to give, to help, to do with our stuff, with our things. Lord, you remember when I prayed about the, the tractor? If you're going to do this and make this possible for us, I, one of my one of my qualifying factors was I must be able to use this to bless others, and I have done that. You opened that door. Same thing with this pickup truck. It must be a blessing for others, not just me, and you've done that, and it continues to be a blessing for others. All that we have to be a blessing for others, and it has been years and years and years and years. Me and my wife's entire marriage. We gave of ourselves, of our stuff, of everything, any chance we found. Now, I'll, I will 100% admit we have not been perfect in that, and we are not going to be. But our desire is to. And Lord, there are times when we just can't give. My physical limitations sometimes stop me from doing it. But I can give in other ways. Lord, may we always be ready to give in any way that is necessary and that is appropriate. May we always be willing to give anything that we have to offer. Even if it's just prayer. May we always be ready to give. Because Lord, like you said in the sheep and goats judgment, and there's another verse, I can't remember where it's at, where you talked about this. What we do to others, we do to you. What we don't do to others, we don't do to you. I think if we would live by that perspective, it would cause us to pay a little bit more attention about what we do and how we do it. And why we do it. Because if I do something or don't do something to my fellow man, it's the same as doing it or not doing it to you. That includes the positive and the negative. And so I should be much different towards my fellow man. They were made in your image too, just like I am. Lord, may we always be ready to be your people and to show the example that we're your people. May we always live out our salvation fully in, in you know, being expressed. That the evidence that we're saved shows that we are light, we are salt. For your glory and to the praise and honor of your holy name. 
for you are more than worthy. May we not worry so much about what we need and about what we want and about our own cares, but instead be ready for everyone else's because there's always somebody that needs help. There's, if I had all the money in the world, there would be no more poor people. Now, what they do with it is a different story. In fact, if we were a better people as a society, we wouldn't have any poor at all. There are some countries that have achieved this, like Poland. Amazing. It's amazing that we have the ability to give whatever we have. It's not just it's not just localized in giving tithes of ten percent. It's expanded out to everything. I can give 80% if I want to. I can give 100% if I want to. It doesn't have to be money. It can be stuff. It can be food. It can be my time. It can be effort. It can be my prayer. It can be anything. I think one of the most powerful things we can do is take our time to go into intercessory prayer for another. What a powerful gift to give somebody. Amazing. Amazing. And Lord, you have made that possible for us to be able to do that. And so that those of us who struggle with normal ways that the society deems normal, we have other ways we can give, and they're just as valuable. And that's not even getting into the subject of the motivation behind our giving. Lord, may we always be ready to give, because this life we live for ourselves is vanity. All the stuff that we do is for ourselves. We're a very selfish race. Lord, may we not be quite so selfish and instead help others as when we can, where we can, and how we can, so that your name be praised and glorified in the mouths of all those who call on your name, and may others see it and glorify you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you very much. We're watching for you. We're waiting for you. Things are changing fast. Things are changing all around the world quick. We're watching. Lord, keep us watching. Keep us faithful. Keep us always ready. For your glory and in your holy name we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for evening devotion. Don't be, don't feel like you're forced to give. The Lord's not going to look down on you if you don't give. A lot of us can't. A lot of us struggle to do that. It's expensive to live right now. This last four years has been horrendous. I used to be able to go to the grocery store and literally fill a cart all the way up to the top. And that was about 250 bucks. 275 sometimes depending on what I bought, but I could level the card off, no problem. I didn't even get half a card today and it was $240. It's getting expensive to live, it's hard to live. So sometimes we don't have the ability to give monetarily, that's okay. Your prayers are more powerful than you realize. Your time and your effort is much more valuable than you realize. So don't be afraid to give with what you have. And you know what? If the person receiving it is, is going to deny it and that's not good enough for them, give it to somebody else. Again, th there's a verse in the Bible that talks about how the Lord takes into consideration the intents of the heart. He looks at your motivation. Even if you don't have the ability, your motivation is key. Your motivation is what makes the action important. And so if you don't have the ability to perform the action, the motivation can still be there and the Lord considers that. So let's not be stressed about this giving thing. I don't want to make that a problem for anybody. I don't want anybody to think that that's something that you have to do. I don't take donations because I don't need donations and I don't want donations. This isn't about that. I'm not trying to make a living off the gospel. I, ha I have what I need. The Lord has provided greatly for us. We're fine. And I don't think that should be a deciding factor in a ministry. Yet, that seems to be the case most of the time. And they'll always say in the sermons, oh, but I'm not focused on that. But then... The subject always seems to come around. I would much rather have your prayers and your love and your compassion than anything else. Your fellowship as brothers and sisters. That to me is more valuable. And even if I had nothing, I would still prefer that because that lasts forever. The money is here and gone. The stuff is here and gone. That lasts forever. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.